by reading from Psalm 23. I don't know what you think about when you think about your father or what you think about when you think about God our Father. And so I was thinking during the week as I prepared for today, where do we find a, a, a description of our God as Father? And I think Psalm 23 is a good place for us to start this morning. So let's have a look at Psalm 23 before we sing. And it's up on, it'll come up on the screen. And we'll read through this together. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amazing words that have rung true since they were, I would say, penned, but I'm not sure that the psalmist had a pen. He, he probably had something to write this down, but since the time that these words were put together, they have stood to remind us of the faithfulness of our God, of the way in which he leads us and guides us, even though perhaps at times we go astray. His grace and mercy, his Love and his everlasting arms around us draw us back to him. And it ends with this promise that goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life and we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So as we come on this Father's Day and as we, we think many different things about our earthly fathers and, and we know that, um, well, I know that I'm not a perfect father, Um, even though sometimes I'm told that I'm reasonably good, I know that I'm not that great. (laughs) But I also know that my father, who is amazing, is not perfect. We don't come to necessarily celebrate humanity in the way in which it is broken, but we come to celebrate relationship with our father today that is perfect because he created us perfect, he redeemed us, that one day we will stand perfect before him. Let's stand and sing this song together. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want.
to ask Paul to put those verses up again for us of Psalm 23. And I want, I want us to just reflect on those. And I'm going to sort of do a, an open mic without a mic situation and ask you to just yell out, what is it about God that struck you as we read those words and sung those? What words impressed you or impacted you? Refreshes. Guides you along the right paths. Amazing, isn't it? He provides everything. 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 He is with us. Isn't that amazing? We don't deserve it, but he is with us. Dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever and ever and ever. What a promise. Yes. Prepares a table. I think that's amazing. Luke picks that up. The idea of him preparing a table for us is incredible, isn't it? And he will delight to be there with us. We have him, we don't need anything else. He provides everything. It is God's grace. And as we come to the communion table later, I'm going to pick up on that word. It's just, it's just God, isn't it? It's God, God, God for us. The security that that brings. He's always there, rod and staff, there's pasture, there's water. Isn't that amazing too? He provides in the midst of what may seem to be very difficult circumstances, in the midst of enemies. He cares for us wherever we are. And I hope that as we reflect on God as our Father, we have that sense of being overwhelmed by his grace this morning. And I know that perhaps some of those words are words that we would ascribe to our own fathers at different times. And fathers are important in life, not only to make life happen, but to provide some of these things, the protection, the care, the faithfulness, the steadfastness. Not to leave out the mums, but they have their other day. But I think it's important that as we gather this morning with the presence of God in our midst by the Spirit, that we acknowledge that he is our shepherd that he leads us, that he guides us, that he provides for us. Uh, one of the, the verses in, in the book of Lamentations, which is sometimes hard to find, so I've written it on the back of my piece of paper here. Lamentations 3, 22 to 23. And Lamentations is about lamenting the destruction of Jerusalem. This is like a really bad time for the people of Israel. And in the midst of of what is a dark uh, book, if you like, it says this, because of the Lord's great love, like in the midst of it all, because of his love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail, they are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And I wonder this morning as we come together as his family around his table at the foot, if you like, of his throne because his spirit is here with us, do we have that sense that because of his great love, we are not consumed? In other words, we should have been consumed because of our sinfulness. But because of his great love, he has pursued us to the cross and allowed his son to be given. And we are not consumed 
His compassion upon us never fails. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Let's stand and sing that song this morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Let's stand together.
Father, great is your faithfulness. You don't give us what we deserve. You overwhelm us with grace. You love us. You love us. You love us. Father, this morning we come before you. We acknowledge your greatness and yet the sacrifice of sending your son. Words cannot express your love for us, nor return the thanks from our hearts. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. I want to welcome everyone here this morning, and if you're visiting for the first time, or perhaps you're here because your father's here, well, welcome. It's great to have you here, and I trust that as we we gather as one family together, it doesn't matter who our human father is, We come with the ultimate father as our father this morning. And so we're all brothers and sisters as we gather. And we thank you. Uh, David Shaw, Dr. David Shaw from Perth Bible College is going to speak to us a bit later on. Must be separated from our David Shaw. Not that uh, one is better than the other. That's not a competition. It's just a crazy sort of name thing that complicates my life. And uh, David's going to bring to us Daniel chapter 5, which talks about the writing on the wall. So if ever you've come across that term, the writing's on the wall, well, it comes from Daniel chapter 5. And so we're continuing our time in Daniel this week. So David, thank you for being with us. And we look forward to what God has given you to share a little bit later on. I'm going to now turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6, and then after this I'll ask the other David Shaw to come and bring the the announcements. We were going through Timothy in the first half of this year. I'm just going to take us back as we perhaps move from reflecting on who God is to reflecting on our role to reflect God. And Paul to Timothy, speaking specifically to Timothy, by extension perhaps to fathers, let's use that today, and by extension again to everyone, from verse 6 of chapter 6 of 1 Timothy says, Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. And I, I trust that we are content because it goes on and says, those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. In other words, contentment or chasing of desires. For the love of money, verse 10, is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. So saying money is a very strong distraction or desire that takes us away from being content with our God. Verse 11, but you, or us, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, goodness, faith, love, endurance and gentleness. What what a mixed bag. But you, man of God, flee from all this, all the distractions, all the things that make us discontent, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith, take hold of the eternal life to which you were called. We'll leave it there. That's our charge this morning, isn't it, under what we've, we've talked about and sung about with the Lord is my shepherd and great is thy faithfulness. In response to that, that he has surrounded us with everything, even in the midst of enemies as we talked about there. What is our response? Contentment or a runaway train of desires? Difficult, isn't it, in this world that wants to do the latter? to be content, to rest in being righteous, in godliness, faith, love, endurance and gentleness. 
And of course, that's what we want as fathers to display to our children. That's what children want from their fathers. A sense of able to trust. A sense of you can put your faith. They're not all over the place. They endure. They'll always be there. A sense of dealing gently with their children. I have a, a moment with Kayla to do with a camera, but she, I don't think she thinks I was too gentle in that moment. It's an ongoing conversation that we have. But anyway, our children watch us. We watch those that have gone before. In this church family, the younger are watching those that are going before. So I'm watching Alistair, and Bill, and Alan, other people that have had a real input into my life. I, I watch what my father does. I, I learn a lot from the way in which he just wants to serve everyone. And I think that's the way life is. We are here to represent Christ to each other. And so this charge from 1 Timothy comes to all of us. How are we living before God in light of who God is to one another? So I'm going to ask David now to come and give the announcements and then we're going to give out the cards and have another song. Thank you, David, and uh, a great welcome to all of you as well. Dr. David Shaw, well, he's that one, <laughs> that's obvious. He greeted me this morning, he says, like looking into the future. <clears throat> I'm, assuming, I'm assuming there's a positive thing in that somewhere. <laughs> it's really good to have you here, and I uh, trust that you enjoy our time of fellowship together. Uh, now, this Wednesday is an event on, it's been on for the last few Wednesdays, it's not that popular, not because it's not good, you're just doing other stuff, so uh, Stronger is an opportunity to come along and spend some time with Kelly. It's quite interesting to see the, the ones who do roll up and, uh, you know, they get sorted out and come here and do their thing. I don't stay down here and watch it, obviously. But that is here at 9.15. If you'd like to come along, there's little brochures here to remind you. And Kelly Smith does a great job. She puts so much effort into it. It'll be rewarding if you come, if you've got the time uh, to do that, ladies and younger ladies. Um, also, now there's something we've been talking about coming up on Saturday. What is it? What's coming up Saturday? Say it nice and daily because it doesn't appear as though that many of you have planned to come. So you need to go online and book, preferably, book those tables. And can I just say, it is a fundraiser. So I know people uh, traditionally go to quiz nights to get cheap deals and things for nothing. But... There's a list of some of the things that have been donated by people, very generous people in the current times, actually, and uh, we'd like you to come along and to pay a reasonable price for these things, get in the enthusiasm of having fun. It's going to be quiet, because it's going to be a silent auction, but please do that because you will be rewarded uh, by getting something, obviously, in return, but also the, the, the money that's raised will go towards uh, the youth ministry here and also work in ministry overseas or wherever. So please support the quiz night on Saturday. That would be really good. I think you'd be a bit harassed afterwards, even though it's Father's Day afterwards by some of the organisers. That's Saturday. Sunday is our AGM. For those who are interested in members, please come along and have that. It will follow, linger longer lunch. You're all welcome to stay and enjoy that. And then... On the 25th, I wasn't going to mention it, but I will, it's the men's and, and lads' social event. It's on Saturday the 25th, I said that, I think. And it's going to be at Sorrento Bowls. It's going to be the real lawn bowling, and it's only $10, so that'll be a great opportunity to come along to that. It's the 25th. Towards the end of this week, coming back to this week, please remember our brother John Pass. He's going in the hospital for a few days, rest and recuperation, probably in a hotel somewhere. No, please pray for him as you go in the hospital. End of the week. God bless. Thank you. Thanks, David. Appreciate that. Yeah, if you are coming to the quiz night, you plan to be there, please make sure. Who should they see at the end of today? Jaylene. Please make a beeline to Jaylene to make sure that you're all booked in. Matt's down here. Yes. Jaylene or Matt. So 
don't leave unless you've registered because we really look forward to that. I really look forward to it every year. It's one of those nights which is almost but not quite for our table. It's always somebody else. Okay, we have a few uh, announcements here. Well, cards. Uh, first one, Trinity Lambert. It's her birthday on the 7th. Is Trinity here? They're not here. More chocolate for me. So, happy birthday to Trinity. If you're watching online, quick clap. There you go. Yeah. Got to remember, someone might be watching you. Uh, Judy Sutherland on the 11th. Judy, are you here? No. More chocolates for me. Congratulations. Now, because I can't get, haven't been able to give any away, is there any people here who are first-time dads for Father's Day? Alex is not here. He could have got one. Anybody else become a father this year for, not the first time, but the second or third time? Or fourth? I haven't got to you yet, Dave. Put your hand down and wait. Father. No? Oh, okay, Dave. Grandfathers for the next time. All oh, right. You can have the single spot. Oh, no. He wants the frog. Yeah. Here you go, Bill. My lad takes two. I've got two grandkids. Oh, yeah, you can take extra. You've got two in a year. That's well done. Oh, I'll take one for Pauline. <laughs> a anyone, a, anyone a great-grandfather this year? No? You can have the whole box. <laughs> sure. Which, which one do you want? There you go. Any other firsts for the men out there? What about uncles? Who's anyone an uncle for the first time? No. All right, maybe another year. It's exciting when things like that happen in families, isn't it? We're going to now stand and sing. Uh, you may have noticed that I've chosen some older songs interesting, isn't it, how songs from different eras affect different generations of people. You actually, um, the songs that were around the time where you're forming your faith become important to you. And so the newer songs that we do do are important for one generation. The older songs that I've chosen a few today have built up the faith of another generation. And so this song, I think, has lasted through many generations. This one is Amazing Grace. So let's stand and sing this as we give glory to God and come around the communion table.
short phrase tucked away in Ephesians 13 verse 9 and just part of the verse actually says this. It says, It is good for a heart to be strengthened by grace. It is good for a heart to be strengthened by grace. It's in the context of not having rituals or being given to ceremonial foods or things like that. Rather than chasing those things that we may think bring us into the presence of God, it is good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace. I'm not sure what thoughts went through your mind as you sung Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved us. Amazing. Uh, I think, uh, certainly I I think for myself, sometimes we we live our life like we're one of those hamsters going around a treadmill. Not sure when to get off and not sure whether we'll crash if we slow down. And I think that's what this verse is getting at here, in part. A bit like in the Psalms where it says, be still and know that I am God. It is good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace. I wonder what that means for you as we come round the table. I think of the word overwhelmed. When is it that our hearts are strengthened by grace? Psalm 23 talks about our cup overflowing. There is this abundance, there is this joy that we can't contain. I was reading uh, the autobiography of George Muller and he talked about the fact that when he came to faith and he was starting on his pastoral ministry of, of reading God's word and of talking about it with other people and of being so captivated with the joy of the Lord that he couldn't sleep all night. I think he was his heart was captured by grace. I think he was overwhelmed. I think his cup overflowed. I know that for those of us that believe and those that come regularly and participate, at some point in time, God has intersected our life and our life has been given over to him. And and at that point, we realise the abundance of salvation that comes through knowledge and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And at that point, we could probably say, our cup overflowed. We were overwhelmed. We realised who we were in the context of the God of the universe. And, And this morning, perhaps you've come for the first time or perhaps you haven't been listening to grace as a concept for a while and that treadmill has been going round and round and life just seems to take its own turn. I, I trust this morning as we, we focus on the, the cup and, and the bread, the body broken and the life outpoured, the grace given that we could be in the presence of God this morning, that we could be brothers and sisters, that we could be one family, that we could know that we will be forever in his presence. Is that, is that the cup overflowing for you? Is that the abundance of life for you? Or is that, mm, I don't know how to spell that, but mm, another thing. I trust it has become this morning and we just stop and I want us to do that as we, in a moment, we will come forward to these three tables here, come one at a time and, and just take a cup and there's a slice of bread on a toothpick, come and take that. And then there's also the offering where we can give back to God from all that he has given to us. And, and just I want you to just go back and reflect on the abundance of grace that he's given to you and ask yourself, what is your response, your life response to his amazing grace?
Let me pray and then please come forward and take communion this morning. Father, as we come before you, we acknowledge that our hearts are often so distracted, as we've mentioned. And so, Father, there's so many things that crowd out our focus, our attention on you. But, Father, overwhelm us this morning by your grace. May our hearts, may our minds, may our actions be just completely taken up with you in all of your glory, your majesty and the outpouring of your love on the cross through the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, it's so easy for us to say the words and much harder for our cool hearts to be broken and melted. Father, I pray that you would strengthen us by your grace. Father, may your love wash over us as we take this bread, your body, this cup, your blood, the sacrifice given for us, for us. You wanted us part of your family and you did this for us. So we bring praise to you in Jesus' name. Amen. So as the song plays, please come and take the cup and the bread, and please feel free to give as well. Thank you.
Father, we are humbled to come into your presence is an amazing gift of grace in itself. That you would love us to the point of death is in another amazing gift of grace. That you want us to gather one day around your throne is again a gift of grace. Father, we are overwhelmed. May our hearts respond in joy, in gratitude, in praise. For you alone are worthy. We thank you for the opportunity to come, to partake, to give. We give you our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. We're now going to uh, do the reading through an online video. Uh, Daniel chapter 5, if you want to follow along, the uh, narrator picks up most of the words of the chapter. I thought this is better than me reading it out. We then, after this, we're going to sing a song, King of Kings. Through During that song, the children can go out to their Pathfinders classes. And then after that song, David Shaw will come and speak to us from this passage. So let's take a look at Daniel 5 on the screen. King Belshazzar had a great feast in his castle. He invited thousands of his lords to come and drink wine with him. While Belshazzar was tasting the wine, he commanded, Bring the golden and silver vessels to us so that me and my princes and wives might drink from them. These golden vessels had been taken from God's temple by Belshazzar's father, Nebuchadnezzar. The king and his lords drank wine from these holy vessels while praising the false gods of gold, silver, brass, iron, wood, and stone. In the same hour, fingers of a man's hand appeared before the guest of the feast and began to write on the wall. And when the king saw it, he was troubled, and his knees began to shake. Astrologers, Chaldeans, soothsayers, whoever reads me this writing and shows me the interpretation shall be clothed in scarlet and have a chain of gold around their neck, and will be the third ruler in my kingdom. All the king's wise men came to try and read the writing on the wall, but none could make any sense of the writing. This troubled the king even more. Now the queen heard how troubled the king was, and came into the banquet house and told him, Let not your thoughts trouble ye. There is a man in your kingdom who has the spirit of the holy gods. In the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom was found in him. So the king brought Daniel in before him and said, Art thou Daniel of the children of the captivity of Judah, who the king, my father, brought out of Jewry? I have heard that the spirit of the gods are in you, and that the light of understanding and excellent wisdom is found in you. Now the wise men and astrologers have been brought before me, but they could not read or interpretate this writing. But I hear that you can make interpretations and dissolve doubts. If you can read the writing and tell me what it means, then I will clothe you with scarlet and have a chain of gold put around your neck, and you shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Keep your gifts and give them to someone else. I will read the writing on the wall and make known the interpretations. The Most High God gave Nebuchadnezzar, your father, a kingdom and majesty and glory and honor. And for all the majesty that he gave him, all peoples, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. Whoever he wanted to slew, he slew. Whoever he wanted to keep alive, he kept alive. But when his heart was lifted up and his mind was hardened in pride, he was deposed from his kingly throne and they took his glory from him. And he was driven from the sons of men and his heart was made like a beast until he knew that the Most High God ruled in the kingdom of men and that he appointed over it whomever he wished. And you, his son, have not humbled your heart 
but have lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven, and brought the vessels of the Lord's house, and have drank wine from them, and praised the gods of silver, gold, brass, iron, wood, and stone. But the one true God, in whose hand you are, you have not glorified. This is why he sent the hand to write on the wall. It says, Many, many, teko, umfasen. Many means God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Teko means you are weighed in the balance and are found wanting. Paris means your kingdom is divided and given to the Medans and Persians. Then King Belshazzar did as he said he would, and clothed Daniel with scarlet and put a chain of gold around his neck, and made a proclamation that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. That night, Darius the Median took over the kingdom and slayed King Belshazzar, just as Daniel had said. Okay, let's stand and sing this song, King of Kings, Majesty. Following this, or during this song, the children can go out to their pastors and then David will come and speak to us. Thanks, David. Well, good morning. Is that on? Yes? Excellent. Well, I uh, get set up here. Um, it is true, I am David Shaw, um, the younger, allegedly hotter model. Um, I like to say that every time I see Dave, but then he reminds me that he has a full head of hair, uh, to which I have no comeback and never, sadly, will. Uh, that is my cross to bear. <laughs> um, on a more serious note, if you are visiting Duncraig Christian Community Church today, um, welcome. Um, I'm a guest here with you, um, and I'd like to you know, 
sort of at the outset lay down a challenge. If you're serious about investigating the faith, uh, 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 the, the Christian faith, um, don't just come here today and be one and done. Um, I, I'd want to sort of lay down a challenge to both you and, and the church here, if I may, um, but that is to actually give the church a year of your life. And the reason I say that is because, you know, being one and done, you don't actually get to see God at work in the lives of the community of believers here. But if you give them a year, I would put it to you that you will see the grace and glory of God in the members here and that you will see how it shapes and changes lives in ways that uh, are manifestly good and beautiful. And I say that not just because Christianity works, but because it's true. And so give, your, give, give this church a year if you're visiting today. Get to know the people. Get to know the good, the bad, and the ugly, and see the grace of God at work in these people. That would be my challenge for you at the outset today before we get into the Word. I'm going to pray, and then we will dig in. Father in heaven, as we consider Daniel chapter 5 and the writing on the wall, would you give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to receive its truth. In Jesus' name, amen. I, I begin with a sad illustration. Sad for me. Sad for some of you, I presume. Um, but uh, in, in 2015, the Hawthorne Hawks played the West Coast Eagles in the AFL Grand Final. And... There were two key moments in that game where you, you just knew the writing was on the wall. Jack Darling's dropped mark uh, when he had a clear view and could have gone back and sort of slotted the goal and settled the nerves and maybe gotten back into the game. That was one. And the other was the awful Luke Hodge threading the needle from almost 50 out on his, on his left foot in the wrong pocket. And at that point, you just knew that the Eagles' day was done no matter what happened from then on in. The writing was on the wall. I'm pleased to say that three or four or five years later now um, that the writing is on the wall for Hawthorne after losing to Adelaide earlier this season. So, um, you know, that's a little sort of friendly dig, a little payback there. Uh, for David Smith. But we all know what that means, don't we? That, that the, we know that when the writing is on the wall, things are going to end badly, right? That's what, we, that's what we know. And the expression actually comes from this part of the Bible. If you've heard that expression and wondered, where on earth does this idea of the writing on the wall come from? It comes from right here in Daniel chapter 5. It's a long passage. I'm not going to be able to go verse by verse as I would ordinarily like to, but what I hope to do is pick some key details that help thread the passage together. So I want to begin uh, in verses 1 to 4, so if you can read along with me here, um, and as, as cute as the video was for the sake of the kiddies, it doesn't quite capture the tone if I may put it bluntly. Um, this is tense, and it's action-packed, and there are a few kind of almost graphic word plays in here that give the gist of what's really going on. Here we go. We know that there was a great feast for a thousand of Belshazzar's lords, and they drank wine in front of the thousand. Uh, now, Belshazzar at this point is probably drunk, and at this point in verse 2, he commands that the vessels of gold and silver that Nebuchadnezzar his father had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem be bought, that the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines might drink from them. And so they brought the golden vessels that had been taken out of the Jerusalem temple, the house of God in Jerusalem, and the king, that's Belshazzar, and his lords and his wives and his concubines drank from them. 
They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. What I want to pick up on here to start with is the vessels, the things that have been taken by Nebuchadnezzar from the Jerusalem temple and brought back to Babylon. This is absolutely key to everything that unfolds. You see, the vessels represent something to the Babylonians on the one hand and to the Jewish exiles on the other. To the Babylonians, the vessels symbolize the superiority of Babylon's gods over the defeated God of Israel. That Babylon won. And they won, and we know that they won because they have the goods from Jerusalem's temple. Because that's what you do when you win. You pillage from the people and their gods. For the Babylonians, these temple vessels are a sign of victory and dominance and power over the exiles. But to the people of Israel, the temple vessels were a sign of hope that God was not actually finished with his people, that one day there would be grace again. And it's interesting to note here, uh, if you would like to, feel free to flick back into your Bibles to the book of Second Kings, if you wouldn't mind, and go right to the end, Second Kings chapter 25, in verses 13 through 15, the vessels are actually mentioned. We're told that the pillars of bronze that were in the house of the Lord and the stands and the bronze sea that were in the house of the Lord, the Chaldeans broke in pieces and carried the bronze to Babylon. And they took away the pots and the shovels and the snuffers and the dishes for incense and all the vessels of bronze used in the temple service, the fire pans also and the bowls. What was of gold, the captain of the guard took away as gold, and what was of silver as silver, and on and on it goes. Well, that, that's interesting. Why include those details? Because they're important. If you turn with me now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to flick you back and forth a little bit. Jeremiah chapter 27. Jeremiah is only a couple of books behind, or in front of, rather, Daniel. Jeremiah 27, beginning in verse 16, says this, Then I spoke to the priests and to all his people, thus says the Lord, Do not listen to the words of your prophets who are prophesying to you, saying, Behold, the vessels of the Lord's house will now shortly be brought back from Babylon. See, the false prophets of Israel are telling the people of Israel, it's okay, you're in Babylon now, but soon you'll be back in Jerusalem, everything will be fine, and all the goods of the temple will come back with you. Now, that doesn't sound like hope initially, but listen to what Jeremiah continues to say. He says, do not listen to them. Serve the king of Babylon and live. Why should this city become a desolation? If they are prophets and if the word of the Lord is with them, then let them intercede with the Lord of hosts that the vessels that are left in the house of the Lord and in the house of the king of Judah and in Jerusalem may not go to Babylon. For thus says the Lord of hosts concerning the pillars, the sea and the stands and the rest of the vessels that are left in this city, which Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, did not take away when he took into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, uh, Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, the king of Judah and all the nobles uh, of Judah and Jerusalem, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, concerning the vessels that are left in the house of the Lord, in the house of the king of Judah and Jerusalem, they shall be carried into Babylon and remain there until the day I visit them, declares the Lord. Then I will bring them back and restore them to this place. Do you see that? See the hope. And so the vessels on the one hand, display Babylon's victory over Israel. But for the people of Israel, hope that Babylon will not have the final word over the people of God and his great city. Now, concerning Belshazzar's action here, there's something very, very wrong. 
And this is what it is. In presuming to take the vessels that belong to God for the service of God and then use them in the worship of idols, Belshazzar, I would put it to you, considers equality with God something to be grasped. He presumes a divine authority in order to actually access the sacred. That's God's stuff. And for Belshazzar to presume the right to take them puts himself in the place that belongs only to God. And as such, Belshazzar puts himself in the firing line. Much like Pharaoh, back in the book of Exodus, he lays claim on that which belongs to God. It did not go well for Pharaoh, and it will not go well for Belshazzar here. And this is the point at which we see the writing on the wall. Immediately. Now, you, you all did Daniel chapter 4 last week, didn't you? Is that right? Yeah? If you flick back only a few verses to Daniel chapter 4, verse 33, we are told that immediately the word of the Lord against Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled, and he was driven from among men and ate grass like an ox. And his body was wet with the dew of heaven until his hair grew as long as eagle's feathers and his nails were like bird claws. Immediately, judgment. And it's the same for Belshazzar. Immediately, judgment is coming. The fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the king's palace opposite the lampstand. And the message that is displayed, mine, mina, tekel, parson. Now, we'll get to what that means momentarily, but what I want to do is focus on the reaction of the king. The king's color changed and his thoughts alarmed him. His limbs gave way and his knees knocked together. The king called loudly to bring the enchanters, the Chaldeans and the astrologers. He says, if you can decipher this, if you can interpret this, you shall be clothed in purple, you have a gold chain, you'll be made the third ruler in the kingdom. And the king's wise men came and they couldn't figure it out. And then the queen comes along. Verse 10. Because the, divin the diviners had failed. O king, live forever. Let your thoughts not alarm you or your color change. There's a man in the kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. In the days of your father, Nebuchadnezzar, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, was found in him. And Nebuchadnezzar made him chief of the magicians, the enchanters, the Chaldeans, and the astrologers, because an excellent spirit, knowledge, and understanding to interpret dreams, explain riddles, and solve problems were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar, not to be confused with King Belshazzar. Now let Daniel be called, and he will show you the interpretation. The queen displays good sense. But there's a play on words here that I think is absolutely magical and hilarious. You see, when we are told in verse 6, or sorry, beg your pardon, yeah, verse 6, beg your pardon, that the king's color changed, his thoughts alarmed him, his limbs gave way, and his knees knocked together. The Hebrew literally says something along the lines of that the knots of Belshazzar's bowels were loosened. Let me put that in Australian slang. He packed his dax. That's what happened. Sometimes Bible translators are too polite. He is freaking out. But the wordplay comes later in verse 12, where the queen informs us that Daniel is one who can loosen knots that the one who can give Belshazzar the interpretation of what is written, right, it's sort of the idea is to interpret riddles, to loosen knots, and the one who can help Belshazzar is the one who can loosen knots, and Belshazzar is the one who, for whom the knots of his bowels have been loosened. It's a, 
like the queen is really giving it to Belshazzar by putting it like that. And it shows you the kind of um, man that Belshazzar is, which is to say he's not really a man in the true sense of the word at all. And that will come forward as we get into the translation of the message that the Lord has for Belshazzar. So after the failure of Babylon's divines, it is suggested to call Daniel. This is dangerous. Here's why. Belshazzar, sorry, Belshazzar, I'm getting, it happens, I'm getting Belteshazzar, that's Daniel. Belshazzar is the evil king. Belshazzar, what's he just done? He's used the sacred things of God, the God of Israel, and presumed the divine right to utilize them for his own glory and his own purposes. Who's he calling on? Daniel. He's calling on Daniel, one of Yahweh's most faithful servants, to translate the message. Now, this is the point in the scriptures. If emojis had been invented, it'd be like this. Uh, really? You, are you sure that's a good idea? But the, the queen knows her stuff. She knows the history that Belshazzar ought to have known. And so Belshazzar takes this frankly dangerous step in having just offended the God of Israel to call on one of the God of Israel's most faithful servants to interpret this message. And then that brings us now to verse 13. Now, I need to give you a little bit of background to the conversation that's about to unfold. Um, it's not pleasant, and there's a reason why. Um, you see, Belshazzar, although he has been called on a couple of occasions already, the son of Nebuchadnezzar, or Nebuchadnezzar has been referred to as Belshazzar's father, that's not quite true. Belshazzar is not related to Nebuchadnezzar. He is a successor, not so much a son. And the use of the language that you have here in the original Hebrew is actually common to the time period of the era. If you were the successor of someone, whether or not you were related, you might be called their descendant or their son. And that's what's going on here. Belshazzar is, in fact, the son of a king, Nab uh, Nabonidus. Um, and Nabonidus reigned in Babylon from 556 to 539 BC, and he came to power because of a successful coup over Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, Labeshi Marduk. So there'd been a bit of sort of politicking and things going on, and Nebuchadnezzar's grandson had been overthrown by the father of Belshazzar. Now, Nabonidus reigned not within Babylon itself, but often away from Babylon. And hence, we have Belshazzar here in charge of proceedings in and around Babylon. So that's the background. And then this is what Belshazzar says. We're told that Daniel was brought before the king, and the king answered and said to Daniel, Are you that Daniel, one of the exiles, whom the king, my father, brought from Judah? I have heard that you have the spirit of the gods in you and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. Now the wise men, the enchanters, have been brought in before me to read this writing and make it known to me, but they could not show the interpretation of the matter. But I have heard that you can give interpretations and solve problems, loosen knots, as it were. Now if you can read the writing and make known its interpretation, you shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around your neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Now, the, the tone of the conversation here, well, it's a monologue at this point, Dan, Daniel hasn't yet responded, but it's one of posturing pride. He refers to Daniel as an exile. He puts Daniel in his place. He reminds him, you're just a slave. You're a nobody here one of the exiles. But more than that, 
Daniel is a symbol of Nebuchadnezzar's reign. It was Nebuchadnezzar who had bought Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego back in Daniel chapter 3. Uh, these were men that were bought to Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar. And, and so it's a reminder of Nebuchadnezzar's reign. And that doesn't sit well with Belshazzar. He wants to outdo Nebuchadnezzar. He wants to be better known than Nebuchadnezzar. He, he is a man full of pride. More than that, but as an exile, Daniel is essentially put in the same category as the temple's stuff. To Belshazzar, Daniel is not so much a person, but a thing. Another thing captured along with the temple goods. And so it appears here that Belshazzar is trying to belittle the legacy of his forebear, Nebuchadnezzar. And I think that's also partly what's driving his use of the cups and the like from the temple. Nebuchadnezzar may have bought the stuff from the temple, but only I have the courage to actually use it. So make it my own. That's sort of next level dictatorship. Notice also the way he puts it. Verse 14, he says, I have heard. He says it again in verse 16. I have heard. Second half of verse 16. Now, if you can read the writing, that's the tone of a skeptic. I've heard which is to say, I don't know. If you can prove yourself, it's the tone of a skeptic. This is a stark contrast to Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 4, verse 9, who says, because I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you and that no mystery is too difficult for you, tell me the visions of my dream that I saw and its interpretation. You see the difference there? Nebuchadnezzar is, I know you can do this. Belshazzar says, prove it, I've heard. But now you, it, it's the tone of a, a skeptic and it displays his juvenile ignorance, not his knowledge. Belshazzar is not a man in the know. He's a man who operates by hearsay. And it comes out in these verses here. And then, verse 17, Daniel speaks. We'll start with verses 17 to 22. Daniel answered the king, let your gifts be for yourself and give your rewards to another. Nevertheless, I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. In other words, keep your own stuff. God's revelation cannot be bought. Daniel is in need of nothing from Belshazzar. He can keep his stuff because God's revelation can't be bought. I will tell you anyway. And we get a bit of a, a history lesson. Now, I don't know about you, but... I, uh, little bit of my own personal history here, but in high school, I was a total, I was a total phys ed nut. Sport, 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 sport. Every elective subject I could choose, I chose sport. And um, all my other stuff was sort of science-oriented, um, human biology, and, and things like that. And so that when I went to uni, I did physical and health education. Um, and I don't know about you, but ha do you ever look back on that time and think, I wish I'd done something else? Because I'm one of those people. And I wish I'd done more of the humanities. Um, I wish I'd done history. I wish I'd done economics. I wish I'd done the classics, stuff like that. Um, and this is sort of one of the reasons why, you see, we too quickly forget the lessons of history. And we, we see it all the time. And Nebuchadnezzar, uh, forgive me, uh, Belshazzar is about to get a history lesson. O king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar your father kingship and greatness and glory and majesty. 
And because of the greatness that he gave him, all peoples, nations, languages trembled and feared before him. Whom he would kill, he killed. Whom he would have kept alive, he kept alive. And uh, whom he would, he humbled, and whom he would, he raised up. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened so that he dealt proudly, he was brought down from his kingly throne, his glory was taken from him. He was driven from among the children of mankind, made like that of a beast, made his dwelling with wild donkeys, fed on grass like an ox, body wet with the dew of heaven. And then verse 22, and you, his son or his successor, Belshazzar, you have not humbled your heart, though you knew all of this, but you have lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven and the vessels of his house have been brought in before you and your lords and your wives and your concubines have drunk wine from them and you have praised idols, gods of silver and gold and bronze and iron and wood and stone, which neither see nor hear nor know. But the God in whose hand is your breath and whose are, and whose are all your ways, you have not honored. In other words, you know Nebuchadnezzar's legacy, you should have known better, but you are filled with pride. And by assuming the right to God's stuff, you have put yourself in his place and now you face his judgment. You're no better than Pharaoh. You presume to take that which belongs to God and use it to put yourself in my place and honor false gods. The lessons of history have been ignored by Belshazzar. And then from his presence, verse 24, this is the writing. Mene, mene, kekel, parson. This is the interpretation of the matter. Mene, God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. There's a lot going on in these three words. Mene, Tekel, Parson. It's a, it's a wordplay and it is devastating for Belshazzar. You see, the supposedly defeated God of Israel now has something to say. And there's a, there's a double word play going on here and I owe credit where credit's due. So James B. John, who is a, a young Old Testament expert working at Tyndale House, um, shared some of this online recently and it's absolutely brilliant. But... The words that are presented, mene, tekel, parson, they function as both nouns and verbs, depending on how you read them, and Daniel takes some liberties in his reading. The nouns reveal Belshazzar's reality, while the verbs reveal God's judgment on him. Firstly, Belshazzar's reality. Mina can be interpreted as um, currency. Um, a mina is the equivalent of 60 shekels. Keep that in your mind, 60 shekels. Tekel is the pronunciation that the Hebrews would use for shekel, okay? So a mina is 60 shekels. A mina, in other words, is much more valuable. A single mina is much more valuable than a single tech, uh, shekel. And then a parson is a half mina or a half shekel. Something divided. But as verbs, a mina is numbered, a, sh a tekel is weighed, and a parson is divided. So I'm going to try and thread the needle here and put all this together. The Mina is Babylon's worth. 
the empire of Babylon is Amina. It's valuable. The empire provides hope for uh, a home for God's people, and it's a big responsibility to be the leader of an empire. But Belshazzar, we are told, has been weighed and found wanting. If Babylon is Amina, by comparison, Belshazzar is only a shekel. He's a lightweight. He is not worthy for the responsibility that is placed before him. The king of Babylon must be weighty. If the, if the empire of Babylon is worth a mina or 60 shekels and Nebuchadnezzar, uh, forgive me, Belshazzar is only a shekel, he has been weighed and found wanting. He doesn't measure up to the value of that which was entrusted to him. And then finally, the half meaner. God has determined Babylon's worth and the kind of man it is it requires to run it. Belshazzar is a lightweight who cannot bear the weight of responsibility and so that meaner is divided and it's going to be given to others. It's genius. What the words mean in essence in terms of Belshazzar's judgment is that he is a lightweight not fit for the responsibility of leading an empire such as Babylon that he is all froth and no bubble a mere pretender and so he is judged it's a devastating critique single words with double meanings in their nouns and verb forms that absolutely shatter the pride, the ignorance, the foolishness of Belshazzar. He is but a lightweight and his kingdom will be divided and given to another. Verse 30 and 31, that very night, immediately, if you go back to verse 5, Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was killed, and Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. And that's kind of where it all ends. It ends with the judgment of Belshazzar and the kingdom of Babylon divided. Three words that penetrate to the heart of Belshazzar's character and his unworthiness for the role in which he found himself. A man who presumed to be, who, who presumed to place himself in God's shoes, use God's stuff to praise idols, and God is having none of it. Mina, Mina, Tekel, Parson. You have been, you, the days of your kingdom have been numbered, you have been weighed, you have been found wanting death but that leaves us with a problem doesn't it the judgment of God <laughs> and we in our day and age we really struggle with the idea of a God who judges but the answer to the judgment of God is found in God himself because the God who judges, the God of Israel, the God who has revealed himself in the person and work of Jesus Christ is also the God who gives and offers mercy. See, what drives Belshazzar's actions are pride and insecurity. He feels the need to best those who have gone before to put others down, to make himself known. Like Adam and Eve, to put themselves in the position of God by taking that which belongs to him. Now, you and I may not be kings of an empire, but let me put it to you that there's a little bit and maybe even a little bit more of Belshazzar in each one of us, myself in included. There's something that drives us. 
We want to be known. We want to matter. We want to know that we count, that we are somebody. And so we strive. We might act like little gods controlling our own destiny. And I don't know about you, but I have lived that life and I've found that life utterly exhausting. And so what would Jesus say to the little Belshazzar that maybe lives in each one of us? How do we cease the striving? How do we cease? How do we get off the the treadmill that drives us? Matthew chapter 11, verse 25, I'll begin. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Verse 28, come to me, all who labor and strive and are insecure and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Eugene Peterson, in his message translation, says, learn the unforced rhythms of grace. If we have a little Belshazzar in ourselves that wants to strive and put ourselves in a position of importance and godlike status, we will find it exhausting, we will come to the end of our rope, And Jesus would say to us, come to me, lay down that burden, and I will give you rest. Know the unforced rhythms of grace. You see, we live in a world actually where it's really hard to find that now. If any of you are on social media, um, things can get out of hand real fast if you write something and someone misunderstands it, and you can get dragged over the coals ad infinitum forever and ever you are forever judged you are ever forever dragged over the coals there is no grace there is no forgiveness there is no rest judgment has been pronounced but in christ in jesus christ there is rest there is forgiveness there is a clean slate if we would but take a step back and remember that we are not God, that whatever we think belongs to us for our glory actually belongs to God and His glory, then God can actually do a miracle in each of our hearts and find rest for our souls. You see, in Jesus there's a new writing on the wall and it's not Mina, Mina, Tekel, Parson. It's come to me and find your rest. See, in Christ, you have everything that you need and more and it's in Him. It, 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 kind of fitting for Father's Day really, but What Jesus is saying here is that my Father knows you and he sent me for you so that you might find rest for your soul in the love of your heavenly Father. Let's pray. Father, it's true that within each of us there's a little Belshazzar that longs for glory and power and honor and to take that uh, whatever the cost. And while we might not run an empire, 
do strive for glory. We do strive for honour. And it's exhausting. So, Father, may we come to the end of our striving and of ourselves and find our perfect rest in you. We thank you that the Heavenly Father, our Heavenly Father knows us and that he sent his son Jesus to give us rest so that we might cease from our striving, find rest for our souls and know that you are truly God. Father, we thank you that this has been brought for us through the blood of Jesus whose death we are ransomed redeemed and restored to right relationship with you that he died the death we could not die reconcile us to you because we could not do it ourselves Father we thank you for this grace today in Jesus name Amen Amen Thank you Thanks, David, for the exiles that thought that God had disappeared. He turned up and he showed that he was still in control by the writing on the wall. The last song that we're going to to sing is called There Is No Other Name. And in the midst of any other God that wants to distract us or take our focus in this life that we now live, we know that we have the same God who has that other name that is the only name that should be worshipped. So let's stand and sing as we conclude together and then tea and coffee after this. Your Majesty, I can, but no, let's go to the next one. There is no other name in heaven can be found. Let's stand and sing this together.
go with this song in your heart, there is no other name that we should worship. May all the fathers have a great day and may we all glorify God in what we do and say. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please join us for coffee and tea. There might be something else out there if we're lucky. Thank you, guys.